I want to tell you a story. We want to tell you a story. We want to tell you our story. This is a river. This is our river. This is our home. This has always been a river. This has always been our river. This has always been our home. This river, the Baram River, is located in central Sarawak. On the island of Borneo. In the country of Malaysia. This river begins in those dark, foggy mountains far away. It follows through this Emerald Creek Valley. And empties into that mighty sapphire sea. This river is big. So big that you cannot throw a stone across it. This river is strong. So strong that it sweeps away our animals in flood time. This river is clear. So clear that you can see the pebbles on the riverbed from a single glance. Well, it was. You know, I put dirt in the water. It's how my ancestors fish. It's how I fish. It's how you would fish if you had any sense. But then my dinner would taste like mud. That's the taste of suffering, of struggle. It's good for you. I think it tastes fantastic. <laughs> Gives the food body. I know my children will eat muddy fish, and they'll like it. <laughs> we haven't told people our story many times. So sometimes we get sidetracked. Sometimes we start bickering. Sometimes we stare off into space like an orangutan perched in a tree. So this river is full of life. You know, your children won't fish at all. Of course they will. Oh, they will. I'm bound to this place whether I like it or not. No, they won't. Because that dirt isn't just yours. It also spills into the water from the logging roads. Yeah. In a few years, our home will be like Long Bank End. The water will be darker than our skin, and we will have to strain and boil it for drinking. Both we and the fish will have to make a choice, move or die. Oh, Leah, you look like leeches have been biting you all over, all pale and worried. Is that blood on my right leg? Why don't they like my right leg so much? Can't they try my left? Great Aunt Fila. But there's nothing to get so upset about. You're worried you might die in a few years. I did it and I feel fabulous. I asked if I could look like I did when I was your age, but everyone up there said it would be misleading and unfair to all the living because they'd always be so sad when I left. Besides that, you'll love the afterlife. Ancestors have always been important to our people, the Cayennes. We believe they protect and guide us. So we praise them, pray to them, ask them for advice, and sometimes they talk back. Great, Steve, we haven't seen you in three years. Why did you decide to ignore us? What were you doing up there that was more fun than talking to us? Hello, my little rice basket. I had no idea that that was three years. A day for you is a moment in a dream for us, a strange, muddy, half-remembered. Uh, a year is a safe, safe dance or a kiss from a lover, as brief or as endless as you want it to be. And to be fair, this is the afterlife. You have your river. We have the Taelong Julan, the river of the afterlife. And it's full of gold, jewels, rice, sugars, papaya, attractive men. You take a dip and find yourself in the middle of what can be on what can only be described as a bacchanalia. Then why did you interrupt all that to talk to us now? Yeah, we're actually in the middle of something. How would you feel if we ignored you for three more years? <laughs> in the middle of something? Oh, this is even better. You know I love an audience. You should know that things are on, on the barn are still changing, are always changing, but not for the better. But we're going to fix everything on you. That's what I said when I was your age. How did that work out? Simo was the oldest woman I'd ever met. She was at least 900 years old when she died. I was 82. You were 90, empty. Oh, yes. I was only 80. You're right. So I'm hearing the consensus is 900. You can't both lie! It's called it's a, a joke. joke. She was 90. I don't understand lying about the age she died at. It makes me seem younger. All right. <laughs> Sorry. She was 90. <laughs> I respect that you're trying to be as funny as me, Joseph, but I always follow what my great aunt told me. Never insult anyone within the distance of a rice field, which means do not insult anyone in your entire longhouse, which can be nearly impossible since that includes almost everyone you know, which means you must insult people in your sleep, which leads to dreams where, every, where everyone I had problems with would line up in front of me and I have one of those big funnels you put to your mouth to talk louder, and I explain my issues in detail. Which explains why my mother would always say, you look so cute when you smile in your sleep. Most of all, we couldn't insult our elders, because elders didn't only have eyes in the back of their heads, they had eyes and ears everywhere. 
the little boy under the log house feeding the pigs, he'll run back to his grandmother and tell all. Your neighbors in the apartment next to you, your, gra your grandfather made the boat they rode uh, in the other day. Even your husband is so loyal to them, he'll give them a piece of fish he caught before he shares it with you. But I don't need to complain. I love them. I'm afraid you aren't as close to your elders anymore, and when we became ancestors, of course, you completely ignore us. Simo, I think you ignore, ignore us a lot more than we ignore you. Yeah, I bet you wish you were in that river of fruit and handsome guys right about now. <sighs> yes. When I was a baby, like all of you, everything was different. Everything was better. Our rivers ran free and clear and didn't have any of that mud he keeps putting in. Not all of that was my fault. They were perfect places for drinking water, bathing, catching fish, swimming. My little friends used to tell me I'd swim faster if I ate the little bugs crawling on the water, so I ate quite a few. Did they make you faster? Mm, no. But I did start walking on the water. The forest was rich and green, and wild birds, pigs, deer were everywhere. Crocodiles, too. But I think you still have those. I could have seen them go. And the food. We grew everything we needed. Just a few months ago in our ancestral world up there, I watched this great, uh, great cousin I knew from long enough. Uh, he looked so proud. He took these cans out of the bag and showed them to his family. And they looked so proud. And then they took it out of the can and it looked like a pink piece of soap or a squishy pink bra. It was called Spam. I couldn't watch them eating it. These are the kinds of things you can buy with money. For us, we would grow our swimming rice, sago, cucumber, chili, shallot, ginger, gourds, coconut, areca palm, a beetle, peanuts, durian, mango, tobacco, papaya, the jack only problem with the pineapple, banana, about that sugar cane, chuba, don't and again stop. tobacco, which we smoked heavily. <laughs> If you don't smoke, I highly recommend it. There's also beetle nut. You should chew that to give you the energy you need to take on the government. <laughs> beetle nut. Like chewing tobacco with more of a kick. More likely to kill you too. Makes you spit blood. It does not. Okay, but it looks exactly like it. Talk all you want, but I live to be 90. 80, right? I was well fed and always warm and safe. Why was that? Because we, we built, built the best long houses on earth. I wonder what the other tribes think of that claim. We'd only need a few ironwood trees for a house dozens of people, for a house dozens of people could live in. A house that stretched further than Ed, the eye could see. We got everything we needed from the river, the forest, the animals. We'd never heard of money. We didn't need metal sheets for long houses, or saws, or spam, or shampoo. Sometimes I look at my grandchildren travel for hours. I look at my grandchildren traveling for hours to build things and I think, what uncivilized brutes. <laughs> we were connected to our many worlds in a way that you'll never be. Sorry kids, we are connected to one another through the daily rhythms of longhouse life. We are connected to the natural world by hunting, fishing, and growing our crops. When I was little, my family believed in a deep dupui, the old religion. So we were deeply connected to the spirit world, the ancestral world. We honored and praised the ancestors through rituals that brought us together as a community. When, when everyone abandoned a deep dipui, I'd go to the, rit the rituals for a deep bungan, the new religion. I'd go to our Christian church. My family converted. My husband converted. Even I converted, like you do when you're afraid of being judged by everyone you love. But... I never really believed, and I miss the old rituals. I know you believe in the Christian God, my little rice basket. I respect that, but know that you're missing out. People your age are disconnected. You're distracted by videotapes, televisions, the cartoon characters and advertisement on the longhouse walls. I see so many of you sent away to modern schools or leaving for a better life in the cities and most of my ancestors have forgotten about me. I haven't forgotten. I've been praying every day, hoping to see you and hoping we can return to the old life. But I wouldn't blame any of these changes on God, Auntie. We can't live in our longhouses. Or fish in our rivers. Or build boats together. Or come for food. 
The bear forest is torn apart and the river choked by logging. We can't bathe in the river, taking deep breaths of fresh air in the morning air. If the air is choked by hate. When the palm oil companies burn what's left of our forest to the ground. Then we, we cannot, cannot live, live here, here at all. all. If the water rises above our heads, above our longhouses on stilts. When the barn river. Our river. Is damned by the government. I know, daughters. I came to ask you, what are you going to do about it? You can cry and moan. You can feel bad for yourselves and your people. You can turn your back and mock your ancestors and refuse to accept that anything is wrong. You can. You may as well climb to the top of a tree and pout. You want to help us? You want to make all of us in the ancestral world proud? Instead of giving us places to aim our most most colorful language in moments of anger. I think we are helping. We're telling our story, telling it to people who might help. There's no one more passive than a storyteller. Uh -huh. Great, then I'm not hurting anyone when I tell them everything I've heard about you. So there was this page. We're doing more. We're going to petition the timber companies that have ruined the forests of Cayans and Ebon and Kenyans. We're going to collaborate with NGOs and we're going to do the government. They've never listened. We wouldn't be here if they had. You want help? You know what you need to do. You know you need to do more, to do what I never did. Their laws are unjust, so why worry about breaking them? Their police are immoral, corrupt, cruel, so why seek their support? Bring back the blockades, Emma. Stand in front of their instruments of destruction. Kill their palm oil plants. Destroy their dams with those saws you bought with their money. Clever. You get us to do what you can never do yourself. Martyrs for your time. No one's getting martyred. You're right, Auntie. We should be doing what you suggest. It's, it's scary, but it isn't that dangerous. It isn't? We've chosen our actions carefully. Simo, we respect you. Return us that respect by acknowledging that we are doing what's best for our people. I have watched for years, and I have waited to speak. If you are doing your best to protect our people, would our people be starving, suffering, eating spam? We were no longer headhunting when I was alive, but before I could walk, my grandmother would sing me this lullaby. Listen well, my little rice basket. Grandfather's head hangs over this fire. Go and avenge us. Do not let the, us give you milk in vain. Not every tradition is worth keeping, but remember what your ancestors did to protect their families and know that you have inherited that strength. And Emma, I did not teach you to forge a sword for nothing. So none of that was planned. Auntie Simo just d decided to pay us a visit. But I think thanks to her, you've learned a lot about us. Maybe more than you bargained for. Like the grandfather's head thing. We haven't taken the time to explain. Maybe we were afraid. Maybe we thought you would be afraid. You should be. Our people were headhunters. We'd stalk through the forest with huge swords, sneak up on men of other tribes, and- We did it in self-defense, Joseph. You know that. We'd cut off their heads. If someone was threatening you, would your first thought be, I have to cut off his head? If he cut off my mother's head, absolutely. You have no idea what their lives were like, and neither do you. Did we keep their heads in self-defense? My great-great-grandfather had one of the largest collections of head al heads along the Iran. You'd go into someone's longhouse, and they'd show you all their most prized possessions. Chinese jars, handcrafted musical instruments, and oh, a bag of heads. Everyone can tell you something horrible their ancestors did. Something they regret, even though they never personally stole land or <coughs> let people starve or enslaved people. This is one of ours. At least you can say we were thoughtful in our killing. That's definitely what I look for in murderers. I mean, our ancestors remembered everyone they killed. For years afterward, they could look them all in the eye socket. They were so proud of what they did, there was nothing more honorable than being a warrior. But the modern, civilized people killed without thinking about it, without caring, sometimes not even knowing it, through disease and poverty and conquest. We stopped. They're still doing it. Conquest. My friend's older brother moved to Sar Sarawak's biggest city, Kuching, to work for the Ministry of Urban Development and Natural Resource. And now he wears their silly melee hats, speaks their language, signs logging contracts, never comes home. He's a modern Malaysian man, and he doesn't have time for the natives anymore. I couldn't pick him out of a crowd. That's why you don't move, you don't leave. If you leave our lands, you become someone else. 
Someone who avoids others' eyes, someone who frowns at herself in the mirror, someone you wouldn't want to hold on to during the storm. So we're never, we're going to stay here. We're never going to leave this river, right? Say it after me. I will never leave this river. I will never leave this river. I will never leave this river. Now swear. I will, I will never, never leave, leave this river. river. I, I will, will never leave, leave our, our river. river. I, I will, will never leave, leave our home. home. 